Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. Happy Friday. Yay. Welcome to Peter's Valley again. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. Tonight is our Friday night instructor presentations. It's when our visiting instructors for this session take turns giving 10 minute talks, a little bit about their work and themselves. So thank you to all the instructors who are participating and sharing your work with us. Um, special announcement, just want to remind you, our fiber instructor, Porfirio Gutierrez, he will be doing a different type of lecture tomorrow and has a, he'll do a lecture and a trunk show of his work. And there's a couple sample pieces up here on the table. So if you're available for Saturday, please don't miss it. Come on here. It's tomorrow at 7 p.m. at the Dining Hall Pavilion. So for tonight, um, we're going to get started uh, to keep the event rolling. We don't take any questions. If you have any questions for our instructors, you know, I highly encourage you, please, you know, meet up with them afterwards. Our first instructor presenting for this evening is in the ceramic studio, Randy Johnston. And to introduce Randy, we have Ryder Gordon, the assistant. Thank you. Randy Johnston is a ceramic artist from Wisconsin. He studied at Southern Illinois University, as well as the University of Minnesota with Warren McKenzie. Later, he studied with Japanese ceramic masters, including Shoji Hamada, where he learned about clay processes and firing wood kilns. Randy taught at the University of Wisconsin River Falls for 27 years. He has contributed to the development of wood kiln technology in the United States, and his work is in collections such as the Victoria and Albert Museum, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Randy is also a licensed ship captain, and his work is influenced by his lifelong passion for the ocean and sailing. In his own words, he is descended from a line of Scottish horse thieves. <laughs> He is a fantastic instructor, and we are really lucky to have him. Welcome, Randy. So I want to thank everybody for being at Peters Valley, and um, what a wonderful community and opportunity for all of us to learn from each other and grow and exchange ideas. And um, it's kind of what life's about, and it's just um, always a pleasure for me to be kind of involved and invited to places like this and share with y'all. So here we go. Start your timer. There we go. Um, I started a studio when I was 21 years old, about four years out of the University of Minnesota, having studied uh, with Warren McKenzie. And I needed a, a hill with at least 18 to 20 degrees to build a Naborigama. And I didn't know what a Noborigama was, but I'd seen a picture of one on the back of a book. It's 1972. I don't know if there were any other wood kilns in the country, you know, but um, highest hill in the county attracts a lot of uh, middle of the night visitors when we're firing for four or five days. You see the scandal. One night a guy's driving around, pulls in my driveway, honks his horn. I walked out, I'm hot, tired, ornery. And I said, what's up? And he goes, well, he says, I thought your, your building was burning down, but I can tell from the look on your face, you don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. So um, I've shared the studio with um, my lovely uh, soul mate and partner, Jan. Uh, and um, we share a kiln and studio. We do not work on each other's work. It's a principle of our uh, marriage is we don't comment or work on each other's work. No comments unless asked and solicited for those. Um, we have a dream studio. We worked in our basement for many years. And when I retired, um, actually before I retired, we built a, a large uh, studio with lots and lots of glass windows. And our architect friend said, you, you need some walls in this place. But um, one of my big influences in school um, as an undergraduate and graduate was Marcel Duchamp, the artist, um, part of the Dada group. And these are the, this is a detail from the nine Malik figures of a bride stripped bare by her bachelors. It's a very famous um, art piece of leaded glass. And it led me into um, developing, de um, lofting three-dimensional forms from flat shapes. So we starting with a flat paper pattern, a flat slab of clay and developing three-dimensional forms from that. Very often my work will start with a drawing. I, taught drawing also for 27 years. 
Um, lots of my drawings are abstract. They're not, um, this is of a teapot. And that teapot gets turned into paper patterns and the paper patterns get turned into three-dimensional objects. And then, then they go into a kiln and um, the kiln either blesses them or curses them. Um, but I, I call it the, the nourishable accident where you uh, learn parameters of firing with, with kilns and glazes and woods and you um, learn from your mistakes, which are many over the years and um, try to profit from that. Um, so this is a, a craggly crackle chino, I call it a crackle chino with just a massive amount of uh, wood ash, five days of about 14 quarts of wood ash is done over this pot. Uh, fire is like a, a fluid, like a river, and it caresses in and through the pots and up through the kiln. And it deposits uh, by carrying soluble alkaline materials from the wood ash, um, it colors on your pots. And the wood ash melts with the silica and the clay and makes a, a glass. Um, it's very labor intensive. It's very uh, wonderful uh, work. And um, anyway, I've done it for many years. Um, this is called a katakuch, it means cut mouth. Um, and it's a kind of a traditional form in Japan. Um, just started making this again. So I actually saw some Egyptian stone forms that had the pouring spout and also saw Noguchi exhibit in Tokyo that had a, a water sort of open bowl. Um, so I said, sometimes I, I just do, uh, this is an informal kind of work drawing where I'm putting down lines and shapes and forms and um, uh, try to, sometimes I'm too tired to wedge up clay and work in the studio and just um, do things like this and kind of doodle and look at the negative spaces between the lines and um, develops into forms like this. I call this a spoon form. This is about four feet long and it's an abstract um, spoon form, just an idea of, um, and it's inspired from the African, South African uh, meat trays. Some of you may be familiar with those um, in, in museums. They're usually made out of wood. Um, a square, squared base, it's darted and um, added to in terms of surface. And this has a green copper glaze. So I did a lot of bronze casting in uh, undergrad and also graduate school and um, love the process of, of working with metal. And picture of my studio, a uh, vase with some fingerprints. Um, I visited a cave in Les, um, Les Ys, France, and in the back of the cave were 25 iron handprints of the people who had worked in the paintings and the drawings in those caves, so men, women, and children, and it was a very visceral and very um, emotional experience, uh, to say the least, and um, to sort of be in the presence of mark making from 15,000 BC, 17,000 years ago. Um, one of our kilns is a 30 foot long by six foot high by um, six foot wide anagama. Uh, we fire usually with a team of about 26 people for um, six days and nights. And we burn about 14 full cords of wood in the, in the kiln. It cools for seven days. Um, it's terrifying to wait seven days and not know what's in the kiln truly. This is a good day. Um, one of the things about firing large wood kilns and people will experience it here at uh, Peters Valley is that you need a community. Um, I had a friend, Mark Ferris, who fires an electric kiln. He said, I don't need a whole village to fire my kiln. But um, I love Mark. But the, you know, the idea of sharing, um, trusting other people um, uh, in the community of, of labor and work to make a kiln like this happen. And across his generations, um, Warren McKenzie and Phil Rogers and um, uh, Ken Matsuzaki, Ron Myers, um, we're all at, at this particular fire and um, sit around and tell stories and lies for five days. This man, Warren McKenzie, uh, if you're not a potter, maybe you don't know who he is, but I was in pre-med and I had to walk into uh, um, artistic expression class to 
fulfill my credits at the university and this man changed my life. And it's, I think, um, always important to, to realize that, you know, take risks, uh, be open. Um, and, you know, you might run into somebody that will change your life. Let's see if this works. Um, material, um, process, ideas, um, human spirit. This is just me um, playing in the studio with some glazed materials and slip. It takes you right back to finger painting as a five-year-old. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. Next up in our special topics studio, we have a Fuse class workshop taught by Sarah Beth Post. And to introduce Sarah Beth, we have our 2D special topics fellow, Lindsay Davis. Uh -oh. SB. Sarah Beth Post is a Pittsburgh based multifaceted artist utilizing glass and sculpture, functional wares, and jewelry. She earned her BFA in glass plus 3D studio from the University of Louisville in 2015. In spring 2022, Post completed the core fellowship at Penland. Her studies of pattern and color paved the path to explore human development juxtaposed to spirituality. SB creates functional wares and jewelry under the name Ultra Lit. And SB is one of my favorite people. I'm so happy that she's here. And please enjoy. Hi, everybody. It'll take me like 20 seconds to get over nerves, but I, I always start with that because I'm like, <laughs> Very jittery. Um, the, thank you all for being here and listening to us talk and for being part of the workshops. And thank you to Peters Valley for inviting me. It's very special to be a part of this um, time here. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah Beth or SB, interchangeable, not Sarah. My first name is Sarah Beth. Um, and S Cookie is a recent addition to my name. I got married back in March, so pretty exciting. Um, we'll start with this. <laughs> so that's um, Shay Rhodes. He is the glass. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, he's the glass professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. He's my, was my mentor in school, continues to be my mentor. And I think it's pretty important to acknowledge the people that have changed their lives and kind of set us on the path to you know where we are today. Um, I started glass blowing back in 2009 at my community college in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and did two years there and was bitten by the glass bug and found out about Shay and the department down in Louisville. So I moved there primarily as a glass blower, um, but by the end of my undergrad career, I was using pieces of glass that I was making in the hot shop and then making panels and then making my own um, slump molds or drape molds to create different forms. So kind of trying to work in all of the different studios is really what keeps my gears turning. Um, always with glass, just trying to figure out the right process for the right idea. And I wanted to put this in mostly for um, the students in my class to see what a flat sheet of glass can do, how it can take on the impression of the mold underneath. 
Um, after undergrad, I stuck around Louisville and worked at a couple glass production studios and then moved to Penland to work with this guy, Dean Allison. Um, he's a glass caster and does full size body castings. And I learned a ton about casting from him. Super appreciative of my time with him. Um, after working with Dean, I started to explore how to cast and work with different powders and billets in my own way. And I also was gifted a huge amount of porcelain dolls because my grandmother collected them and she passed them on to me. And when I say a huge amount, I mean like a hundred or more. And so that's a thing. A lot of people are like, oh, porcelain dolls. Wow. Um, but I love my grandma and I grew up in the house with her. So I was used to them and I needed to figure out how to work with them. So I started to take molds off of the doll accessories um, and the dresses in particular, trying to figure out how to capture the fabric and then using the dress form as uh, a palette or a canvas to sort of figure out different ways to work with color and be expressive. And this work is called um, Treasure Island. So using clear glass over top of color to kind of make it look as though it were disappearing. This is about a 17 by 17 square that it's hard to tell in this photo, um, but it's molded off of like a children's play foam mat. So it has that really nice texture and it was actually cast in two parts. The green triangle is separate from the white square and then it's inlay together. So almost seamless, um, just in place with glue. And I started to explore this type of work when I was in my fellowship at Penland. And a part of it was technical, but also still working with these sort of childhood um, like objects. And I like working with objects in that realm because it makes me think about innocence and maybe speaking to like everybody has this time of past when they were younger and can kind of reminisce about maybe times that were a little bit lighter. Um, I like to use different types of powders and fritz to capture emotion with color, but also this was more of a study trying to capture the idea of like sand art bottles when you go to art festivals. It's really the same process. It's a lost wax uh, mold process, but then filling the mold with very specific amounts of colored sand. Teapot in the same sort of format. And these are the same type of texture as that big square. Um, I think you can read it. It says, Mama said, knock you out, but I'm going to lift you up. And while I was in school, I was a creative writing minor. So I try to incorporate that side of my brain as well. And this is called remix number one. So taking LL Cool J's line and then transforming it for myself to be something that is a positive message. Um, I've been thinking a lot about when I'm taking up space in the gallery with my work, I want to try and make sure that I'm imbuing some type of positivity behind it. Um, this work is more of like a word puzzle and it reads justice is not a fad. I usually give people like a couple tries to figure it out, but <laughs> we have 10 minutes. Anyhow, um, uh, this was made during the time um, you know, shortly after George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor and how thinking about like how much we wanted to have a voice and wanted to kind of push back against um, all of the sort of like horror that was happening in the media and then seeing that message across like social media fading out, you know, for, for so long you protest and then over time 
that protest sort of begins to fade away just because of time. And so this was a way for me to make a work that is continuing the protest in a gallery space. Um, and this actually does exist in somebody's home, which I'm pretty happy that it lives and is out there every day. Um, in that same vein of work, I'm taking words and kind of breaking them down and really thinking about the meaning of them or what meaning we might just make up on our own. And this is accountability, but breaking it into the different words that are actually found in that word. And also trying to be a little bit lighthearted. This is, <laughs> don't grow up. Um, along with my sculptural work, side by side, I make production glassware. Um, this is blown and sandblasted and then carved on a lathe. So I tend to layer colors and then take it to a glass lathe, which is you have the actual tool mounted on the lathe rather it's reversed from a wood lathe and you're holding the glass to it. And it's a way that I explore my mark making. Um, Ultra Lit, as Lindsay said, is the brand in which my production is sold under. I'm also a flame worker. My husband is a flame worker. So that's our primary studio at our home. Um, these are, this is just a version of the necklaces that I make kiln formed pendants that are also carved on a lathe. These are plates. They're very simple, two sheets fused in the kiln and then carved on the lathe and slumped. But again, using the carving is a way that I tend to explore the expressive mark making. Another version of that. I just love these colors. And I'm going to close with, I work for and with an organization, Crafting the Future. Um, we're a small nonprofit, and we partner with different schools like Peters Valley and Penland, and we have youth arts partners like Glassroots, and we try and connect um, the different opportunities to um, artists of color. And we provide scholarships and try and give um, you know, we are just working to see more diversity in our field. Most of us have been doing a lot of craft schools and have either been like the only one or have noticed the only person of color in their workshops, and we wanted to change that. Um, and this is a recent residency that we were able to put on at Penland. This is Better Together. So it's six um, Black glass blowers and six um, black ceramicists that were on campus all together with our studio assistants and it's just good vibes all around. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Beth. Next up in our fine metal studio, we have Talia Cantro and to introduce Talia is our assistant Cam Netkin. Uh, Talia has been making jewelry since I believe she was eight years old. Uh, since then, she's done everything from production work to 3D modeling, CAD jobs, and uh, even spent two years as our fine metals uh, fellow here at Peters Valley. So please join me in welcoming back Talia. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to preface this by saying that I lost my slide presentations at some point recently, and so I put this together last night, so we're going to see what's on here. I just don't remember. So it looks fine. Rachel said it looks fine, so I think that we are good to go. Um, but what? Thank you. Exactly. Montserrat, extra light. Great. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. So uh, like Ham said, I got started with medals um, when I was eight years old at my summer camp, um, Long Island, New York, which is where I'm from. Um, this picture is not from them because that would be crazy. This is some of my BFA work um, that I made when I was at New Paltz. Um, I couldn't find my work from when I was eight years old last night at, at 11 p.m., couldn't do it. But um, uh, after I got into this when I was younger, I decided that I wanted to do it um, more permanently and I decided to go get my BFA in it. And I um, discovered enameling there. So this is some of my uh, BFA work. So 
I've always had a fascination, kind of a horrifying fascination with deep sea fish um, and depths in the ocean. So I was trying to make work about it back then that used utilized enameling, um, cloisonne and champlevé to kind of highlight the, um, the contrast between how grotesque these creatures can be at the bottom of the sea and then how um, beautiful I think the technique can turn out to be. Um, this is the classic angler fish. So on the floor was a viper fish. Here's an oar fish, which are the largest bony fish. They can be like 36 feet long. It's very cool. Um, but this is a brooch. It's about yay big or, or so. Um, and so during these techniques, I really fell in love with enameling, which we're clicking, we're clicking. We're fine, we're good, we're good to go. Um, and here's another one, a golfer eel. Um, and that was my BFA work. Um, and afterwards, I'm gonna kind of go linearly here the past however many years, but also I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, I'll let me made this slide last night. So um, after I graduated from undergrad, I came here to Peter's Valley where I was the fine metal studio assistant. And that is what my bench looked like back then, kind of as a, a little extra for Wyatt and Cam to see and Maddie. Um, so I sat there and I always, anyone else have joined this group? Oh, um, I can do this. Okay. You're good. Um, I always credit coming to Peter's Rally for the first time back then um, as a pretty important turning point in my career as an artist and as my career as a craftsperson. Um, and how I value craft and how I see the difference between art and craft and industry. Um, so it was a really important time in my life. And when I was here, I continued working with enamel. So that's a poison egg fish that I made for my fellow at the time, Lucy. Um, and yeah, then immediately after that, I have some pictures later on, but I did some bench work at a studio um, in Tel Aviv. So I was doing CAD work and bench work for them there and developing um, some engagement rings for them. And after that, wow, we're going more linearly than I thought. It's kind of just a timeline of what I have done. Um, but after that, I did a year-long residency at Focosan Art School of Fine Craft in Columbia, North Carolina. Um, so here's just a really pretty picture of what it looked like down there. Um, and that was kind of my first delve really into self-motivation because I had been in school, I'd been in academia, I had been here, which, you know, nobody has to make anything here, you just want to. Um, and it felt the same kind of for me at Picosin, but um, I, I just felt more pressure to self-motivate and to make work. And I was kind of grappling with, well, why am I making what I am? Um, why do I want to be making things? And what do I really want to do with it long-term? So. Um, I started investigating enamel a little bit more, um, and I developed this technique where I try to make the work look like an old Greek vessel. Um, so I will inlay pieces of copper into the work before it's fired um, and create that stippled older look. So some more deep sea fish and a little deer that I made for a friend who likes the woods and ferns. Um, and I was also thinking, about things other than enameling, getting more into process. So these are some brooches. This is the same brooch that I made um, that is covered in these little textured dots for my class. It is with a center punch, the same thing we use to mark the metal for drill bits, just a lot of them. Um, and these pieces were more about process for me because it takes hours and hours for me to get all of those dots in and to assemble them in a way that doesn't destroy the pattern. Um, so I was kind of enjoying the process, but also figuring out how the process impacts the final piece and how I relate that to my work. Um, I also had some fun, made a big old cheese box. I have that up at the studio, you can kind of take a look. Um, more of the dot pieces, the buckle, I have a whole series of these, um, this frame brooch, um, the, Stones, I mean, not everything has to be conceptual, which is something that I also grapple with a lot from academia, but um, I just stuck them in there. I think they look nice. And I still think they look nice. Um, but this is work that I was making at my residency at the Cosin. I also did some outsource work there. I was the one being outsourced um, 
for some artists, Matt Wamber and Marisa Nett. Um, so this has a whole backstory to it, but it's um, about these reindeer in Norway who are being kind of exterminated by the government and the Sami people are trying to keep them alive. So this was commissioned um, for a group trying to preserve them. Um, I made a lot of those there. And then I went to grad school. Great. Uh, <laughs> I went to um, RISD for grad school um, uh, six months before COVID started. So that was exciting for me, but here's a really picture, pretty picture of Providence. Um, and while I was there, I was still trying to um, push the stippling idea, push my journey with the process um, and the end results. Um, since COVID was, COVID started while I was there um, and I was getting a little like jaded with the academic world in general because COVID was going on. I didn't know how to deal with like, well, we're supposed to be making art, but the world is kind of falling apart. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, is this of value to me at the time? Um, and so I was making work that really dealt with that because um, I didn't feel like I was really in the studio enough. I didn't feel like I was making the work that I should have been making. So this piece is kind of how I felt at the time and I felt like I was really being lazy and not going to the studio, but I'm also using a technique that is incredibly labor intensive, um, a lot of fabrication and stippling and there's like stones in the side. So it's just kind of contradicting itself. Um, and this one, I really just went off the deep end with that. And I just wanted to make work, but I didn't know how to really like resonate a concept with that. So um, I made these series, which I like this piece. And then this is the same vein. It was kind of progressing, but it's a little brooch, 3D printed. It says pull for art. And then you pull it and it says this, which I think is pretty fun. It's pretty big. It comes up to here. Um, ooh, we are speeding through my 10 minutes, aren't we? <laughs> okay, so we'll speed up. Um, none of that work turned out to go into my thesis. Um, I did a big old pivot and made some work about um, modern Judaism, which I was raised, um, it's called conservatox, but partly orthodox Jew. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of these because of the time limit, but um, I was interested in loopholes in modern Judaism and how they relate to biblical Judaism, big pivot from the other work. Um, so you're not allowed to carry anything on the Jewish Sabbath, so, but you can wear clothes. And so I, made a chair that was part of a garment. So if you had to wear a coat, you could also bring a chair with you. So it's kind of a way to get around that if you needed to bring a seat. Um, and then when you sit down, the coat drapes over the back of it. Similarly, you can't carry things outside of your residence, um, but there's a loophole that if you have something called an Arif around a public place, it goes from public to private. And so I made jewelry around that that only goes around your hand. So your hand can carry something, but the rest of you can't. Um, and I made some mezuzahs, which are kind of self-explanatory, but they're nice. Well, maybe they're self-explanatory, we'll see. Um, then I came back to Peter's Valley for two years as the artist fellow. I made this pop-up for Sean Hood Simmons over in the back, woo-woo. Um, and currently, this isn't current, this is work from Bacosin, but I'm currently a CAD designer. And so when I was at Bacosin, which is when I really got interested in doing CAD, we're gonna be like one minute or two minutes over, we're gonna be fine, um, <laughs> really fast. Um, I got interested in that when I was in Tel Aviv, I was doing CAD work for them. So this, I 3D modeled um, in Rider 3D, we got a cast and then I was enameling it for them. So kind of all around. And currently I work as a full-time CAD designer for a company in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, this is not what I make for them, but this is a fun little anglerfish because I'm still doing that. But most of the time I'm doing this kind of thing where um, it's crafted in the virtual space. Um, everything is modeled online not online on a computer um, and then I will render it and we will get it manufactured so that is rendering those I mean they exist now but those aren't real and this is not real and I just put that one in because I thought it looks really real but it's not real um, and these are not real and the students in my intro class right now are going to make stuff like this that is real but these are not and I think that that's super fun so I'll speed through the rest that's kind of what I do now um, and make, I work with a lot of diamonds and gold and computers and 3d printing and I also have some fun with a little puffin. Happy birthday. And I just have too many pictures of these at the end. I don't know what I was doing. I had some fun, made a little dog. Um, we're just gonna click through these. I had so many pictures of, oh, look how much fun I have all the time at work. Uh, but some more renders, which is fun. 
And then here's a picture of when I was in Peters Valley of all four seasons of White Devons, where I used to live. And that's it. Good job. Thank you, Talia. Okay, our next instructor for this evening in the box mix shop, we have Jordan Lamotes teaching. And to introduce Jordan is our blacksmith fellow, Anna Koplik. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Jordan is a Forge and Fire champion and a master smith in the American Bladesmith Society. He is a farm kid, and when I visited him, his mom gave me homemade cheese, and I watched her milk a cow. Uh, Jordan makes delicious pie. He, he is in an absolutely adorable family band, and is also a contra dancer, as am I, so that part's really exciting. Um, it might have been a fever dream, but I think I remember him winning a push-up contest at a bladesmithing hammer in where no one else could do push-ups. If that didn't happen, it could though. Um, anyways, everyone welcome Jordan. It could have. Yeah. It feels real. I have absolutely no recollection of a push-up contest. So anyway, well, thank you all for having me here and being interested enough to in my work to send you know ask me to be here and and for all of the parts that you play in this organization because it's a really cool place and I'm just getting to know that so I'm going to talk a little bit about my work um I'm going to go rather chronologically from about the time where I graduated college which is right when I went full-time as a knife maker so I I've been blacksmithing I took my first blacksmithing class when I was about 13 and Throughout high school, I was doing mostly blacksmithing. I was building, building the tools for my shop and equipping my space in my own workshop. And once I was in college, I started doing knife making as a way to kind of make a living eventually. And I mostly was drawn to knives because it ena enabled me to work in a lot of different media under one umbrella. So I get to be a blacksmith and a machinist and a woodworker, and I get to work in non-ferrous metals, and I get to do leather work, and I get to add to the list every couple of years. So let's start. So this is this is you know kind of my my background slide here is pretty typical of what I do today. Like this is this is the kind of work that I did. This is two years ago, but it, relatively you know I do a lot of high-end chef knives. That's kind of the bread and butter of my work. I'm going to start with this piece. This is a kind of early piece from my full-time knife maker days. And the, uh, you know, Randy in his talk talked a little bit about taking risks. And I feel like that that's a pretty good theme in, in my own artistic process. I'm always trying to push myself to do something a little fancier, a little more involved. And so this was the first step in that direction to take, okay, what is a knife is a functional thing. It has to do a set of, of functional tasks. And that includes, you know, that involves being knowledgeable about the metallurgy, about the use, the end use of that blade, about how you need to shape the cutting edge, how you need to shape the handle. There are a lot of mechanical parts that go into it. But then there's also the aesthetic part of it. And I want to kind of meld the two, make things that are both beautiful and useful. And many of my pieces are used on a daily basis by their owners, their chef knives. This one is not. This was another step down that, in, in, in that direction. This one might be slightly out of order in uh, chronology here. But this is a sword breaker dagger. It is modeled off of a handful of daggers that were made in Italy uh, around the 15th, or sorry, 16th century. And it would have been used as a, a parrying dagger in a rapier duel. So you'd have a rapier in your right hand and you have one of these suckers in your left hand and this would catch the opponent's sword and allow you to stall it for long enough to get a good stab in. And this, also brings me to another theme in my work, which is history. I am fascinated with historical processes from 
cultures all around the world, historical processes and, and designs of, of weapons, of tools, of, of ways of using metal. The, the Industrial Revolution has so shaped the way we think about materials and the way we think about tools and the way that we work that looking at pre-industrial pre designs and techniques can be a really fruitful ground of inspiration. And I have, I have made ample use of that. Okay, so one major step along the journey. I'm a member of the American Bladesmith Society. The American Bladesmith Society is a, an organization that is dedicated to the education of the forged blade, education in, uh, about the forged blade in, in, um, in helping people learn how to make knives and specifically by, by forging them, by you know, starting in the, in the forge with the, with the hammer and, and anvil. And so the American Blazemen Society has a ranking system where you go from journeyman, or sorry, you go to, from apprentice to journeyman to master smith. And in order to attain any of these ranks, you have to submit a set of five knives. These go to a panel of judges, seven master smith judges at the Atlanta Blade Show. And they you have to pass based on a set of very rigorous standards for fit and finish and symmetry. So what we're talking about here is all of the sanding lines need to be exactly parallel. No J hooks where you start and stop. All of the gaps, you, you can't have a gap between any of the components. When you look down the blade, it should be absolutely dead nuts straight and there should be no variation in symmetry side to side. These are the things that they're looking for. And so it really demands of you to, to put forward your best work. And so this was the set that I submitted for my journeyman test in 2018, and I passed. Here's another historical piece, jumping to a slightly different portion of Europe. This is a Scandinavian type sax. Uh, like you might see uh, in in a in a Viking find, with taken with some liberties, of course, because we have to guess a little bit at what the hilts may have looked like. But this is Damascus steel, so this is pattern welded steel in the blade in a relatively traditional Scandinavian style with with five individual bars of different patterns and interrupted twists interrupted twist patterns. There's a carved moose antler in the, the, the bolster area and some curly maple with silver studs. And then I did all the leather tooling as well. The leather, leather work is also part of what I do. Here's a little peek at some of the inlay that I did. I taught myself how to inlay. Well, I was actually, a friend of mine taught me how to inlay a couple months prior to this, but I did a, a couple of practice place pieces, and then this was my first attempt at doing inlay on a on a piece. So it's not pristine, but it's I thought it was clean enough, and I'm I'm proud of it. So here's another historical piece. This was kind of a a life changing piece for me in some ways. So Anna mentioned that I was on Forged in Fire. Forged in Fire, you've probably heard of it. It's a reality show on the History Channel, and by many reports is. A little bit corny, though it's also very engaging to watch and, and quite funny. Um, but it really changed my life in, in a lot of ways. Uh, namely, I had to go on this show and I had to make a tulwar. Tulwar is an Indian saber. I didn't know that at the time. I had to do some research in the day that I had before, between filming the first two episodes or first two challenges down in Brooklyn and traveling back to my home forge to make a talwar in five days. So during this process of learning about the history, I, I you know, learned how much I really didn't know. And I won that episode. And then I started getting commissions for talwars. And this was one of the talwars that I got as a commission. This was made for a Sikh wedding in British Columbia. And I had the opportunity to, do, to document an original 18th, 18th century Indian talwar at an exhibition in New York. And I used those dimensions as accurately as I could. Dimensions, you know, both for the, the blade and the hilt 
and the shapes. I took tracings and also did the weight and balance point to try to match them as closely as I could to the original, and then treat it with my, treated it with my own materials, my own Damascus steel, some very slight change in blade geometry, and all of my own engraving on this fabricated brass hilt. Okay, moving forward. So here is some of this high-end chef knife stuff that I like to do. This is a really bold pattern. This, all this pattern welding that you see, or Damascus steel that you are basically synonymous, is done with two alloys of steel. You forge weld them together. And by the way that you forge and restack and manipulate the layers, you can come up with some pretty crazy patterns. And so this is an example of that. This one also involves a couple of these maybe more uh, jewelry kind of techniques. So you can see at the, the butt cap, the butt end of this handle, there is a piece of meteorite that is bezel set in silver. And so I have, this is all ancient materials other than the blade steel. There's mammoth, woolly mammoth molar and silver. And this is bog oak that was preserved, uh, it was preserved in a peat bog in, uh, in Ukraine, I think. And um, that gives it that beautiful color. Here is it in its saya, which is its cover. So then I passed the Master Smith test. So this was my five knives that I submitted for Master Smith. And I'm running a little bit out of time. So I'm gonna run through quickly some of these individual pieces. Again, historically inspired. This is a dagger based on some German daggers that I observed. <clears throat> Whoops, here's a detail. Some of the carving, the file work, the Damascus steel. Here's a sujihiki. This is a Japanese style slicing knife in Damascus steel. Here's a gyudo. This is a different style Japanese knife, slightly wider. This is a more Western style. And you can see I have these kind of curving facets that I've been playing with in my in my work. This is another Indian inspired piece. This is a Peshkabs. It's a T-spine dagger. Here's a Puko. This is a Scandinavian style knife. Here's just a little detail of that nickel silver and antler Cocobolo African blackwood. Here's another Puko I made pretty much concurrently with that other one. This one has a little bit of carving in the bolster. Okay, so then the, the last most recent chapter of my knife making education is I went to India on a Fulbright grant for nine months. And I was studying particularly a technique called Kaftgari, where you overlay gold and silver onto an iron surface. It's traditionally used to decorate weapons. And I was studying from two master craftsmen in Udaipur, India, Rahul and Sandeep Singh Chohan. They're brothers, and they learned this from their father and are very much involved in the trade. And so these are the two knives I made in India. And Rahul and Sandeep did the gold on these particular ones. So I didn't do this Kaftgari design. I did a lot of the filling work, a lot of the kind of work that the apprentices would have done on the Kaftgari, but I didn't do this gold work in particular. But I did make all the blades and the hilts with very primitive setup in India. More recently, I did this gold work myself. So I have been working this into my own work slowly. This is a this is a fairly classic style American hunting knife with a gold pattern that is inspired by a Persian pattern I saw on uh, in, in a book on a gun barrel. And here's one more fancy big old Damascus chef knife with some more curvy facets just to show that I'm still doing that. And if you want to find anything more about the stuff that I do, here's the place to go. So thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't that was okay. <laughs> thank you, Jordan. Okay. In our workshop this week, we have two instructors teaching adventures in steam vending. Our first instructor in the Wood Studio to give their talk is Chelsea Witt. And to introduce Chelsea is our assistant, Lara Mochales Matti. Hello.
So Chelsea was born and grew up in Florida. Recently, they moved from Maine to Philadelphia, um, has been working in woodworking for 15 years, specializes in furniture, has been now teaching for eight years, uh, is the education chair in the Chairmaker's Toolbox, sits in committees of organizations such as the Furniture Society and a workshop of our own. A fun secret fact, they were in the International Children Touring Choir for 10 years. So hopefully we will get some karaoke nights this week <laughs> and Chelsea here can perform for all of us. Sure. Welcome, Chelsea. I'm not gonna sing for you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Peter Zwelli, for having me. Um, this is my second time here this summer, so super exciting. And also to represent mentors, Yuri Kobayashi is one of my mentors and I'm thankful every day that we are now friends and that I get to teach with her sometimes. It is a dream come true. So thanks, Yuri. So I put this picture up here because this is a fun picture of me when I was a child while I tell you some not fun things about me um, that were stressful. And I do this because I think that sometimes coming to a place like this, people are talking about their art and you're like, wow, you're so amazing. And there's a lot of bumpy roads that go along with getting to be where you are. And so I like to talk about those things. So I'm gonna tell you my story getting here up till now. So I was a very fun child, but I also was a very practical child. And I grew up in a pretty low income household. Nobody in my family had gone to college, but I was like, I'm gonna be the one to go to college. I'm gonna be a surgeon because surgeons make a lot of money and I like to use my hands. So that's what I'm gonna do. I shouted my first surgeon in fifth grade, open heart surgery, got to stand right next to him. I just wrote him a letter and said, can I come and shout at you? Didn't even know who he was. I got to do it. He said, yes. Um, and then that was my path. I became an EMT before I graduated high school. So I worked on ambulances in high school. That was fun. And then I was pre-med all through college. And uh, while I was pre-med, I also decided, well, I still like art, so I'm getting an art degree as well. Neither of those things line up as far as credits go. So I was taking 18 credits a semester. I was going to school in the summers, working three jobs because I had no money. And by my junior year, I was burnt out. And I felt like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take a break from pre-med and I'm gonna just focus on art and get my art degree. But I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. I'm gonna go back to pre-med. So by the time I finished my senior year, I was too burnt out to go back and finish my pre-med credits. So I said, I'm gonna go to summer camp for a summer because I grew up going to summer camp. So I found a summer camp in, Midcoast, Maine, that for some reason let me start a woodworking program at their school. And I only had one year of woodworking experience <laughs> from my college. And I started uh, milling lumber from the property and making stuff with campers. It was a family camp. And so I was working with adults, I was working with kids, and I was really excited to be doing it. And in my time that I was not there, I was traveling back to Florida in the off season. And I was working for a guy named Alexis Dole. Um, he let me apprentice with him. It was unpaid, but I was just happy that someone was letting me get some work in furniture because I thought that that's how I'm gonna make money if I'm really not gonna go to med school because it was still in the back of my mind. Um, and so I was making stuff like this. I was sanding a lot, um, doing a lot of finishing. He was also a metal worker. And that was his primary thing. So most of the woodworking was rudimentary, just sanded nice and smooth. He was using a lot of like local Floridian cypress trees and things like that. Um, and that was fun, did that for a while, but decided that I wanted more experience in furniture. So I didn't quite know what that meant. And I found a furniture company in Philadelphia that would hire me. So I ended up going to like the opposite spectrum. And I went to this company called BDDW in Philadelphia. This is like high-end interior designers, production furniture. So I'm working on a team of like 65 people. And again, I found myself mostly sanding. <laughs> I'm like, when do I ever stop sanding? Um, I was still going back to the camp in the summers. Um, this job in particular wouldn't let me take off for the summer, so I would quit. And then in September, I'd call them and ask them if they wanted me back and they'd say yes. So I worked there for about three years. I got a lot of fun experience. Like I 
worked a lot on the leather team. These are leather wrapped credenzas down here on the bottom. We did a lot of painted work, um, but I wanted, I wanted more experience. And so I found myself going to Penland and the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine. And I realized that, oh, there is summer camp for adults making art. And my mind was blown and my world was opened up. And I decided at that point, six years later, I don't need to go back to med school because I found these things now. Um, so I spent eight weeks doing a concentration at Penland. Um, and I was making things like this. It was a multiples class. So everything that you made had to be at least two. Everyone else was making all these cute, fun, like 20 small objects. And I'm like, I'm going to make furniture. And because it's a multiples class, I'll make two. Um, and this kind of jump started my own personal furniture journey. Um, these were pedestal tables with this concept of is the table the art or would you put art on the table? Who knows? You decide. Um, these are in my grandma's closet to this day. If anybody wants to buy them, you can. Uh, my grandma won't use them because she says they're too valuable. Um, here's some close-ups of those. Um, I then went and took the three-month furniture intensive at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship where I met Yuri um, in person. And I actually didn't know that Yuri was there. And I walked into the building and saw Yuri and turned around and walked right out because I needed a minute to compose myself. I had seen Yuri's work when I was in college and it was very inspirational to me. Um, this was my case piece in the class. It's actually kind of small. It's only like this big. Um, but I was interested still in this idea of things like protruding through your furniture and like, is the thing the furniture? or like, what do you do with that thing that's protruding through your furniture? And while I was in my concentration, I discovered the technique of coopering. Um, and this took me on a very long, deep dive. Uh, coopering is a the old te technique of like barrel making. And so I realized that I could incorporate this into furniture, but I didn't quite know how yet. And I also realized that there was a lot of math behind coopering, which really spoke to the practical side of me. And so I went into a deep dive into like how to figure out these equations that all the furniture makers around me were saying, you don't need the equations. You can just draw it out and find the angles and you're good. Or there's actually already calculators on the internet that can do that for you, but I wanted the equations. So I spent about six months doing research, talking to mathematicians, trying to figure it out. I found all the equations. There's about 10 of them, if you would like to know. Um, and I can basically take any compound angle that I need to and bring it all the way around in a circle and not have to care as much about the errors that will happen along the way and needing to adjust by hand. So I then got the opportunity to go and assist um, a master cooper in a Marshall Sheets. He was doing a class at Haystack. Someone suggested me to him. And I had a really fun time because I got to see how someone was doing traditional coopering. Ended up making these little buckets, which pushed me into taking coopering into my previous work that I had done at Penland. So I created um, this table, which is two coopered cones that are flared out at different angles and connected in the center. Um, and through research and questions and the trigonometry that I'd essentially been able to discover in it all, um, I was able to make jigs to get me all of these things pretty easily and um, not have to deal with the errors that were coming from before. Thank you. Um, here, when you look down into the table, it has a glass set top and I have a silvered mapled veneer on the inside. So when you look down in, it actually looks like this cascading waterfall. Um, I like to think of it as my black hole of coopering that I found myself in. Um, here's another little detail. During COVID, I went back to illustration work and drawing. I was something, pen and ink was something that I was always interested in growing up. And it's actually why I decided to do my second art degree at uh, when I was in college. And so I found myself drawing again because I couldn't be working in the wood shop that I had been at. And so I started doing work like this. Um, these are larger scale 
ink on watercolor paper. And that led me to trying to combine my illustration work and my furniture, which I had never thought to do before for some reason. And this was my first piece back in the shop after all of my drawing series that I had made. I like it. And I would say it's a pretty literal interpretation of combining my work. And so um, after I made this piece, I had a bunch of offcuts and I ended up making this little piece, which spoke to me in a different way than I had felt. I thought that this was, um, if I had made this maybe two years prior, I would have thought that's simple and it's just some offcuts, but there was something about it that was speaking to me that was a way of combining my two practices um, that I had not never thought to do before. And so that's when I started pushing this concept of um, combining the illustration. This, this is actually stained with ink. Um, and you can see I've brought back in coopering, coffee table, led me to this bench. Um, this has coopering and steam bent pieces incorporated into it. My time is up, so I'm going to flip through the rest of my work here. There's some detailed shots of that piece, um, bringing in those technical things that I learned in fine woodworking, but trying to stay true to the line work that I want in my pieces. And the last year has been all about case pieces. This one was recently in the Peters Galley, Gallery, Peter, Peters Valley Gallery. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, tambor, two tambor doors. I'd never made tambor doors before, so I wanted to do that. Um, you can see I'm kind of working with those rudimentary shapes again. This is my most recent case piece. Uh, first time using color in a piece. I don't normally use color in either illustration or my woodworking, so that was very fun. My dad builds pools, and so that's where the tile inspiration came from. I call that piece the diving board. Um, and then my other passion is working with organizations and bringing representation into the woodworking field. Um, I recently became the uh, education chair at the Chairmaker's Toolbox. If you don't know about it, you should look it up. It's very cool. Um, and as Lana stated, I also work for a workshop of our own and Furniture Society involved with Maine Crafts Association. And I'll leave you with a wooden fortune cookie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, our next and last speaker for this evening is our other wood shop instructor, Yuri Kobayashi, and Lara Machales Mate is coming out to introduce her. Yeah. Hello again. I get two tonight. Yes. Lucky me. Yeah. Okay, Yuri is a Japanese artist. Uh, she studied architecture in Japan and was trained woodworking there. And after moved to California, did an MFA in San Diego State in furniture design, right? Yeah. Uh, and then taught over 10 years at RISD Furniture Program, which I wish I had gone to. Um, now is trying to be a full-time maker, which I think she is succeeding at. Um, is the lead fellow at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine. And fun fact, she can bend wood and she cannot sing, so she will not be invited to karaoke. No, <laughs> we will invite her anyways. Anyways, welcome, Yuri. We're really happy that you're here. Thank you, Laura. How are we doing? Can we go with another 10, 12 minutes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, this is my first time at the Peters Valley, and I'm enjoying it. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you. And then it's nice to see some old face that I met a few years ago. And uh, yeah, here I'm teaching with Chelsea Wynn and uh, adventures in the scene bending. And here we go. How do I do this? Let's do. Oh, here. And so steam bending is. Just to let you know, you can see quick video woodworking technique where wood is exposed to steam to make it pliable. Heat and the moisture from steam can soften wood fibers enough so they can be bent, compressed, or twist. And when cooled down, they will hold their new shape. So this is something that 
um, I would like to incorporate in my work and you will see it a lot. Um, so I was born and grew up in Japan and the essence of Japanese ethics or aesthetics and the culture was embedded in me before I recognize it. And I, well, because I grew up in a culture that holds a strong relation with the tree and my curiosity about the wooden objects and the buildings came naturally. I studied architecture, but unfortunately or fortunately, soon I found an architect is not to build, but to design. And um, I chose to train in Uruakin. So I moved to this beautiful city, Takayama, which is 200 miles uh, northwest of Tokyo. And, and this kind of showing that Japanese woodworking hand tools and the machine shop and the bottom row is a kind of shop uh, two years of training. And then while I was working there and then I decided to stay at that school for four more years as I worked as a staff. Then I met this uh, Wendy Mariama an artist, furniture maker, educator, and a role model for many of us. Visit the school and with her encouragement and the support, I moved to California and studied under her guidance. Now, one of the many lessons I learned from her, you got to be a little insane, stays with me to this date. And during grad school, all the my work are just like this. Um, some of that grit work, ladders work, all that, 10 feet tall, grit work, ladders work, 17 drawers. And then uh, during the graduate program at the San Diego State, working with clay, and then also introduced to the steam bending technique, incorporating that technique helped me loosen my approach to creating work. Phase, this installation explicits the universal nature of the life cycles, evolutions, and births to death in all creatures. And then I believe in idea that collecting many smalls together can lead to a meaningful and powerful outcome, more than just the sum of the parts. Earlier, my work was often composed of many small parts without the surely not skeptical sculpture sounds. I trust my gut and then I dive in. It is risky when a plan you hoped works, yet nothing is guaranteed. You would not know the result until completing that piece. This piece believing um, is an interpretation of my belief system in relation to the sun. Something to hold on to is a good sample of how my idealistic plan works out in the end. A six, feet diameter, real like a structure made of many parts stand on its own without the glue. And the foam itself and the purpose of the sailing vessels are so inspiring. Also eggs and various seed pods are captivating and symbolize life. This represents me somewhat collecting together upright. I am ever grateful to mentors, friends and communities surrounding me as supported by those many people, I feel the vessel might be able to take off like a rocket. I think my previous life was a bird. Yeah. I so wish I were a bird. Then they dream, what if a rebuquet stretches, re uh, perform like a bird's wing? If so, am I ready? Do I have guts enough to run, kick off the ground, let go and be free? And then on and off, I had worked on a series of mindscape series and using the same shape and mold. And this one's ride. Until the pandemic, I had not stayed in one place continuously for longer than eight months. Um, I've been here in the United States almost 20 years, but up until that pandemic, I was like moving one place to another. And then I've been carrying such a nomadic life by the choice and the feel uh, losing a sense of home, not so much missing it, but perhaps dreaming it. On the continuous bumpy ride, that vehicle with four wheels supports my living style and continue to search for that next journey. Chase, sometimes you draw yourself into a corner and are beaten. 
up by a cruel reality. From time to time, I learn there are things you can't reach and barely touch, but never obtainable, no matter how hard you work for it. Battle. The wheel is rolling. Fears arise when not knowing what is ahead. Fears freezes me when I know exactly what it would be like. I stop and then imagine what could happen. That moment of the mind battle. Should I go or not? Maybe fine, unless otherwise I will never know. Burst. Accumulated frustrations and layers of uncertainty overcast my head. Not knowing what exactly they are, it grows inside. Just like a too much air inflated in a balloon, it eventually explodes. I scream loud in the studio or at the beach and surprisingly feels better afterwards. It's okay and better to let it out. The whisper. Once in a while, I hear a whisper of evil, a sweet invitation to so-called the black hole or rabbit hole. The whispering sounds so appealing and even soothing to my wrecked mind. Once caught and trapped in it, I knew it was almost impossible to get out of it. I wish there are no whispers and strive to cancel the noise. Letting out and turning my thoughts and feeling into three-dimensional abstract forms help me shape my life. Distracted by too many antennas, a curio, an abstract format of a creature could be myself. Occupied with many negative thoughts and disturbing emotions, keeping from being sane, I focus on listening to my heart. And so I, from time to time, I uh, my interest shift and between non-functional and functional. And either case, I like taking on challenges and solving problems, which is my deep rooted motivation in the making. And we just explained what's going on in the sink, cooperating, street bending together and under the table and chair, uh, twisted parts, making up a uh, fanciest trash box or glass top side table and deep into bending exploration. Uh, bending exploration is seeking out a large scale installation. Gonna have to go kind of cut it short, but um, this had to not, uh, has not happened yet in that, our workshop yet, but uh, you can do steam, actually feeding it into the poly tube while you're bending it, steam is still running. So I'm gonna, pass and then keep going to the time right Rachel and then I hear you and okay and so this is the kind of result uh repetitive use of the simple and the same bending form uh coalescence is the site specific installation in this case 260 bent units were joined by metal hardware engaged to activate the space at the Arizona State University Art Museum and using the exact same bent form, but in this case is made it and turn it into the functional uh, piece of furniture, glass top table. And this case is the same material ash, but ebonized into black. And another, uh, going back to sculpture, um, this is my first attempt to kinetic sculpture and another view, I don't think I included. So I'm gonna just do quick moving motion. So this is a time-lapse video, much faster than actual movement. And then I use a seam bending technique to even make a scale model. So this is kind of rocking chair design ideas and right picture is the mold to seam bend to create the rocker of that rocking chair. So again, here we go. Um, is it moving? Yeah. So inside of this poly tube, 10 feet long stock, and the steam is feeding inside, bending around the mold. So 
So at this point, it's just upside down U shape and flat. And then detach from the steamer and bending it to the other orientation to make that rocker move back and forth. Almost there. All right. So this is the final result. And that's recent work for uh, commission dining chair. And then I also made a company side table. And then the view. And this is the last piece that uh, I made and displayed uh, to the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship. And I think last. Yeah, this is the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Wow, that was an amazing group. Thank you so much, instructors. You did a wonderful job. Thank you for coming up here. I know it's never, no matter how many times you do it, it's never easy to stand up in front of people and talk about yourself. So thank you. I really appreciate that. You all did wonderful. And I think I just can't wait to see what comes out of everyone's classes. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. This concludes tonight's talks. If you ever need anything, um, extra blankets, pillows, whatnot, go to the gallery. They can help you out. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you.